Okay. Now what do we do? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, let's start. Huh? Yeah, let's I get guess. started. Yeah, let's get started. So, the thing is that... Um, what's your name? Louis. Louis. Louis Brawley. Brawley. Brawley, as in brawling all the time. <laughs> Good. That's what somebody told me. Yeah, what, what I'm going to talk about is um, is a man that I met years and years ago. Mm. Uh, he was from India, and somebody told me he's a kind of guru, and I wasn't really all that interested in gurus. So I said, no, this one you should really see. Mm. And uh, I came there, there were quite some people there, and he was sitting there, and I was totally amazed by the way he was talking about the things that gurus mostly talk about. He was very uh, tough and uh, people were amazed because it's all about love. And he said, love is a four letter word, he said. You know what I mean? So, yeah. And I was, I, was really, I was really quite excited about this man and I said, wow, he's He's taking all those things that we are so stuck with, that we are so grown up with, and that we have to do in order to be enlightened or whatever. He throws them out, you know what I mean? And he, he, um, yeah, he, he changed uh, my whole way of thinking in a way. And later I met him, and immediately I interviewed him, and I made, I think, four or five interviews with him and just listening to him and he was quite amazed because he said you're the only one that I can talk with because most people attack me you know or go in the, in, in the defense mode mm. because they can barely believe what I'm saying you know and uh, you met him too huh? mm. and you spent quite some time with him yeah so when did you meet him for the first time 2000 and Two, and uh, it was in a hotel room in New York. Uh, and I'd read all of his books online before meeting. He never wrote books, eh? No, but he there were re, re, people. People there were records of his discussions with other yeah. people. Yeah. This was one of the things that interested me about him. That yeah. He didn't write a book. No. He, like even my previous obsession was with Jiddu Krishnamurti. Oh, because then what do you grew up here in Holland? Yeah, sir, that's a lot. Yeah. Well, he didn't grow up here. No, but he I certainly mean, he spent some time here. He spent quite some time here. And he had a castle here. somewhere local. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which he allegedly gave back, but anyway. Yeah. So I grew up with that guy, sort of. This is what got me into this messy business of this so-called seeking. And uh, he was writing very poetic journals about the otherness and things like this. And this UG character... Uh, was saying nasty things about himself, that meditation was... A, and uh, the reason that I connected with Yuji was because of the last name, Krishnamurti, or whatever the yeah, name. Right. But they were, of course, not related. But I was... I, I thought initially, cynically, I thought, here's a guy, he's probably a relative, and he's probably trying to get in on the business. Yeah, yeah, the big guy's already set up this whole empire, yeah. and now here he comes, this punk kid, he's going to get a little action out of it. So I read his books only out of cynicism, and very quickly I was taken aback by, first of all, in the first book that I read, online for free, was that there was no copyright on any of these books, no the material. And that immediately got my attention, because I thought, well, usually that's not the case, I and mean, everything is copyrighted. And then there was no, Jiddu always spoke about no guru, no teacher, no, but there were schools and institutions and exactly. all this. But I thought, well, the guy was, whatever, he was trying to help people. Yeah. Then this Yuji character points out, he says no teacher, no teaching, no taught, and then he goes out there and sets up institutions and schools. And this rang a bell also, because by this time, I had been informed of the fact that Jiddu, who, who turns out was human, for a long time I thought he was some very special, elevated being because he insinuated 
in all of his behavior that he was celibate. Whereas I discover that he had an affair with his best friend's wife for 20 some years. <laughs> Which I thought, well, I don't know who cares if he's fucking around, but why is he then saying... He's celibate. No, he says, the thought of sex never even enters my head. Oh yeah, right. So, uh, <laughs> what does it enter? I mean, maybe he will... So, he never said anything in favor of marriage, and he never said don't have affairs, but he insinuated many things about himself which were not true in the end. But the bigger, in a way, criticism um, for me was when I read that he set up these schools, and I thought, yeah, because when I went to see Jiddu speak, I was very disappointed. Because here's a guy on a stage, and he's way down there, and I can't talk to him, I can't approach him. Then this Yuji character is, is saying that he met that guy and he had long conversations with him, at the end of which he said, what is happening here? You know, you tell me that there's nothing you can do, so why do you give these talks? Anyway, the impression that I got from Yuji, I was told it was the same kind of thing that JK was saying, basically. But it was radically different from what JK said, initially. And the effect of it was to erase the obsession with Judo Christian Marie for me. But of course it was immediately replaced by an obsession with who is this Yuji character? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I had to go to a hotel room in New York to meet the guy. He, he, he stayed there? Or he, gave his... he was in town. I, I actually was in touch with someone through the website, which is how I heard of him. And uh, this person gave me a telephone number. And I called the telephone number hoping for information about where he might give a talk or something. And when I called the phone number, a woman answered. And then she said, well, would you like to speak with him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I was thinking, well, that's kind of strange. You just speak directly with him? Yeah. yeah. Certainly if you called Jiddu, you'd only get a recording or a secretary or something. Yeah, right. You're not going to get in the same room. No. Well, did she put Yuji on the phone with and I, I was very taken aback, but I said, you know, he said, who is this? I said, my name is Lewis, and I'm, I'm a, what you would refer to as a JK freak. But I have somehow, by reading your books for free online, I feel this enormous relief, and I just wanted to thank you. And he laughed, and I laughed. And that was the beginning of the end. <laughs> <laughs> because people said also he's a gruff, tough guy, and you'll never, you know, and I thought, well, I'm just curious. If somebody can say what he's saying in these books, I want to see this guy. Yeah. Somehow, I mean, there's so much bullshit out there. And I have very little patience. And until I encountered his, um, whatever, his expression, I had not seen any contemporary outside of Jiddu Krishnamurti who really impressed me initially because he wasn't quoting someone else. He was speaking for himself. Whether or not he was honest, I don't know now, but yeah. Jiddu was not quoting other people. No. And I liked what he was getting at, but he didn't go far enough, I guess. Yeah, he was quite famous. He was quite famous, but beyond that, what he was saying was not dependent on dogma. What I didn't realize was, it, it was that he had turned himself into a dogma. But I didn't know that until I saw someone who was free of dogma. Yeah. I mean, so when I, when I, was, when I went into the room with Yuji Krishnamurti, I was across the street from where I first saw J.K. speak at Madison Square Garden Auditorium. So. Some near 20 years before. Yeah. After paying maybe $20 to, for a ticket. Yeah. I walk into a hotel room with about six, eight people sitting around and a little old man on the couch. I don't pay a nickel to walk in there. Right. And I get a meal out of it and I go home totally confused. Uh, these two people, the way they operate is radically different. Yeah, absolutely. One guy's charging money and telling you not to have a guru while he's sitting up on the stage. Yeah. Inaccessible, like all gurus. And the other guy is saying, there is no such thing as a guru. There's not only that, there's no such thing as enlightenment. Thought is a, your enemy, you know, uh, what is it? the mind is a myth, or <laughs> all yeah. of these things. But 
the impression that I had of this person was of someone who was completely, uh, well, he was quite baffling actually, initially. I was, yeah. Because it was so um, vulnerable, he was very unprotected in the sense, you know, he wasn't, he had nothing to pitch. He was talking nonsense, actually. He was talking, he was telling me stories that he would tell. And they seemed absurd to me. They seemed unrelated. And I kept waiting for him to get to the point. Yeah, to yeah, get right. to the point, Eugene. And then I can and I was waiting to ask a question. I was desperate to ask him a question. Something relevant. And when I finally started to launch my question, he chopped me off at the legs. That's not your question. You just you've been asking I how many people have crossed my threshold who have that same question that's not your question. You don't I couldn't even get it out of my mouth. And I thought, wow, what am I supposed to do? You know. So I just sat down and thought, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to do here, but I'm <laughs> going to wait until the next chance for me to ask a question. Yeah. Which you know. What kind of question did you want to ask? I think it was about okay. You're saying all these things about how there's no enlightenment, there's no nothing, but you're in a state you're different than I am. That's what I wanted to say, but I couldn't even get that much out. He was chopping me, chopping me, chopping yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. No, no, don't, 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 just shut up. It was more or less like, just shut up. Yeah. <laughs> you sit down and shut up. Yeah. And leave. But somehow I knew he didn't mean it. The yeah. Le the leaving part. Yeah, I, I, I once was in a, in a meeting with him and uh, he said to somebody, uh, uh, you better get out, otherwise I call the police. Yeah. <laughs> like that, people were totally shocked indeed. Yeah. But there were people, I think, who he could get rid of without saying a word. Yeah. I mean, by being what he was, he yeah. eliminated 99% of people to begin with. Yeah. He just had, because he had no, nothing to offer, and he was not selling anything. No. And we're so used to being sold yeah. false comfort that when the real material comes across, it's so frightening that people leave the room immediately. Yeah. They call it cynicism, they call it whatever they want, but they will immediately excuse themselves from that so they yeah. don't have to deal with it, I think. Yeah, exactly. You know, and people say, oh, you're talking that way because he was your guru and he's your... And I, there's nothing I can do about that crap that people want to launch, you know, about how, why, you know, why do you even talk about it? Why do you say anything about it? Well, if you've seen the most amazing thing you could imagine, then you're going to walk around with your lips zipped, you know, that's not possible for me anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, because he, my, my instincts were, through most of my life, that most of what I encountered as an artist, as a so-called, you know, seeker of religious truths or spiritual, 99% of what I encountered was bullshit. It was not operating, it was not accessible, or it didn't work, or it was a cheap pitch. Or it just didn't, you know, J.K.'s choiceless awareness, or you know, whatever. What the art world's promise that the artist is revealing secret truths of the universe—that's bullshit. Yeah. You know, all these things are bullshit. They're sales pitches. And I finally was in the room with another human being who said they're bullshit. They're sales pitches. And I felt incredibly relieved. Yeah. Right. That was the sensation was of relief. Yeah. Like ah, oh, somebody else who sees through this. Yeah. Um. And of course, I wanted to spend more time with someone like that. That's really what it was. So when people launch all this guru talk, I mean, of course, you you feel attracted toward people who have a similar, whatever, uh, inclination maybe. But also, the the guy had the kind of energy of a wild animal. I mean, he had a, he had he was completely untamed. Yeah. At the same time, ultimately civilized, polite knew how to proceed, you know, he knew how to behave, he wasn't interested in breaking the laws. No, right. At all. That no. didn't interest him. It wasn't necessary. He just was not caught up with all these things somehow. The way I was, otherwise I wouldn't have been there. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, most of us are, you know, yeah. so that's the way we have been uh, trained, you know, to it's be... The circumstances of our existence. Yeah make this almost impossible not to be. Yeah, exactly. So you say, say teachers for about 20 years until they're an automatic pilot and yeah. then 
It and starts with your family. Yeah. And then it continues with the educational system. Yeah. And then the final stamp is you enter the work world and you become a whore for the rest of your yeah. life. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Or you're shunned out, or you're rich enough to to indulge yourself in all the things that people who are bored do to keep from going insane. Yeah. Yeah. So. True. And then there's, for me too, for the first time, a man who doesn't follow that pass at all, you know, he... No, but what's fascinating about him is that you sensed that he had been down that road. I think it's one of the, one sure. of the wonderful things about you was that he, he did all these things. Yes. I think he, he, one of the lines that really hooked me in his, in, in the mystique of enlightenment was when he said, they tell me that I'm supposed to be a gentle, meek, kind person, and I'm a monster. Yeah. I'm filled with rage. Something is wrong with this picture. Yeah. And I thought, that's me. He's describing me. I've been meditating. I've been doing all these therapies. I'm trying to improve myself. And in the end, I'm an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So what good did all that do? Yeah. It does leave you with that question. Yeah. I have seriously in investigated these possibilities. And yeah. I'm still caught in this bullshit. What's going on here? And then for me, because of that, because I had been trying for myself, when I walked in and saw someone who had resolved that in themselves, whatever that means, whatever he was, those things were no longer the issue for him. I felt that more than I could. I can't prove these things to anybody. There's, no. There's no point trying, but I knew it when I saw him. Yeah. You look at someone, you look them in the eye and you can see, Something is missing there. <laughs> missing or present, I don't know which. And I really, I thought he was crazy at first. A little yeah. bit. I was worried that he was senile. Yeah. Yeah, I have, I've met many people who think so. But I, was, I remember so having that idiots. thought. Yeah. And then he looked, picked me out in the room and said, Hi, what's Sarah? Huh? How are you doing back there? I hardly knew the guy. and he, But he, the radar was unbelievable. Yeah. It was just a dead on. 